Will you pray with me? Father, again, we come before your presence in this very significant time as we open your word. Father, I again pray that uh, our minds and our hearts would hear your voice. Speak to us, Father, we pray. Grant us ears, not only to hear, but a heart that listens and obeys as well. May we find strength and comfort, find rest for our souls that only you can give. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Recently I was reading the well-known author and Christian apologist, Rabbi Zacharias, was telling of a time that he was walking through the streets in New Delhi, and he came across one of the newest shopping malls there that he had what he called, uh, that had what he called the globalized reproductions of stores that you can find in just about any country that you go into, say, for instance, Hong Kong, Paris, Tokyo, or even New York. And there he found in this new shop specialized uh, stores that sold name brand items. But also he found some that specialized in cheap look-alike brands of the original. Coming up to a display of knockoff versions of Rolex watches, that is replicas that looked so identical to the real thing, only an expert could tell the difference. He asked the salesperson behind the counter, he said, he said, how in the world do you manufacture these knockoff versions of Rolex watches? Well, the shopkeeper was instantly incensed. And he rebuked him and he said, he said, well, he said, he said, listen, what we have here are genuine fakes. <laughs> Not the fake fakes like the guy around the corner is selling. <laughs> so then Dr. Everybody Zacharias asked him, he said, well, he said, won't these genuine fakes let you down after a while? Won't they fail after a while? To which the man looked him in the eye and he said, so will you in a few years. <laughs> You know, like it or not, we live in a world that is mass-marketed Jesus of the Bible. Globalized reproductions of Jesus have so reshaped his principal identity that you can just about find any kind of brand name Jesus around the world that you want. There is the genuine Jesus, and then you have the knockoff versions of Jesus, the genuine fake and the fake fake Jesuses around the world. How do you know the difference whether you have a real Jesus or whether you have a genuine fake Jesus? How do you know the difference? The key difference is this. The genuine Jesus is not going to fail you within a short period of time. He's not going to fail you at all. Amen. That's the key difference. I am convinced that many people in our world today who say, you know, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I'm not that impressed, quite frankly. I'm convinced that many of those who say those kinds of things about Jesus have never met the genuine Jesus of the Bible. Amen. But they've been sold a cheap bill of goods and they still are suffering from buyer's remorse. The genuine Jesus of the Bible, when you actually meet him and you have a personal relationship with him, changes your life in every aspect. But one of the key differences between knowing the genuine Jesus of the Bible and any other kind of Jesus, the world may flaunt our direction, is that the real Jesus will never let you down. He will never fail you. Jesus alone could make this unswerving promise. He said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I am convinced that there is an irrepressible hunger that every single one of us have in our lives. An irrepressible hunger to find genuine rest for our souls. The world has a way of draining us, doesn't it? Life has a way of taking it out of us. And we long for escape from the world that we're in. And yet we realize that nothing, nothing in the world offers that ultimate rest, that ultimate meaning that we long for. Well, as we come to the book of Hebrews, it reminds us that Jesus alone is that ultimate rest, that ultimate person who will never fail us no matter what we're going through in our lives. 
You know what is fascinating about the book of Jesus or the book of Hebrews? We've been walking through this. Is that Hebrews really is putting Jesus under a microscope, if you will, and examining what does the real Jesus look like? What does the genuine Jesus look like? So that you know when you see a fake or a genuine fake or a fake fake Jesus, you know right away it's not the real one. So the author of Hebrews has been examining the character, the person of Jesus Christ, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, etc. All the way through the book of Hebrews, he's examining what does the real Jesus look like? Because you need to know, this Jesus who will never let you down, you need to know exactly who he is. Because if you buy into anything less, if you buy into something different, you're going to be let down. So it's so important to understand who is the genuine Jesus of the Bible. Don't be bought into or don't buy into a cheap bill of goods, the global reproductions around the world that they have. Well, there are a couple things I want to do with you this morning. As we come to Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 19, uh, we come to what is one of the more difficult passages in this entire book. There are a number of warning passages, in fact, five warning passages in this book. And every serious-minded believer is going to ask this question as they read these warning passages, one after the other after the other. The implication, or what it seems that these warning passages are saying, is that you can lose your salvation if you're not careful. And so every serious-minded believer begins to ask himself the question as he walks through these warning passages, What does it mean to be saved? How do I know that I'm saved? How does I know that I have the genuine Jesus and not a genuine fake Jesus or a fake fake Jesus? How do I know? So as we come to these five warning passages, I wanted to kind of step aside for a moment and explain, give some foundational understanding to these five warning passages as we begin to unpack them in the weeks to come because it's so important as we look at these warning passages What is really happening here? Because if we can unlock the mystery behind these warning passages, it will help us understand the rest of the book of Hebrews and the real message and help us to see Jesus more clearly. So what I want to do with you this morning is I want to answer this question for you, try to answer as best I can for you. What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be saved? Because that's the implication behind each one of these five warning passages. Can you lose your salvation? Can you not? If they're not warning passages saying that you can lose your salvation, then what are they warning us about? So let me kind of go back and ask this question. What does it mean to be saved? Now, if I were to ask you, if I were to ask you today, say, are you saved? You would say, well, yes, I'm saved. I'd say, well, you've only got a third of the answer right. And you say, what do you mean? To say that you're saved only answers a third of the question. You say, what in the world are you talking about? I'm saved or I'm not saved? What do you mean a third of the question? You see, when you look through the lens of the Bible and you say, are you saved? Salvation really comes in three different parts. Now listen carefully. Listen carefully. When the Bible talks about salvation, it says three things. It says, I am saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. And he uses three fancy terms that are very important for us to understand. Now, before you think, where is he going with all this? What does this mean? What kind of relevance does this have to do with my life? And let me assure you of this as we look at this. This has incredible relevance to you understanding who the true Jesus is, the genuine Jesus of the Bible. The Bible uses three very important terms when it talks about our salvation. It uses justification, sanctification, and glorification. And all those three terms simply say this, as they say that I am saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. And if you understand what this means, not only will you understand who the genuine Jesus is, whether you really know him or not, it will also unlock the mystery behind these five warning passages in the book of Hebrews that will give us a sense of, oh, good, it's not saying I can lose my salvation, or maybe it's, I don't know. So let's kind of walk through these three aspects of what does it mean to be saved. First of all, you can say that I am saved, and that fancy word there is justification. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter what. You see, justification 
happens the moment I cross that line of faith. The moment I say yes to Jesus Christ and place my trust in Him as my Savior and my Lord, justification takes place. Now what does justification mean? Justification means this, that God declares the believing sinner to be right with Him. That God declares the believing sinner to be right with Him. So what does it mean to be right with God? It means now I have peace with God. It means that I am now God's eternal, unconditionally loved and accepted child. The longing in every one of our hearts, the longing in every one of our hearts is to know, am I unconditionally loved? Am I unconditionally accepted? And God says, yes, on both counts. You see, the moment we trust Christ, we have the secure knowledge and the growing experience of having God's eternal love unconditionally and His acceptance forever. That is what is the true experience of every growing believer as they come to the assurance of knowing that my Father, my Heavenly Father, eternally loves me, unconditionally accepts me for who I am. That's called justification. So what does that mean in our lives? It means this. Does that mean that we can live however we want the moment we trust Christ? No. What that means is this, the moment I cross that line of faith and I become a child of God, something radical happens inside that is eternal and unbelievable. It is simply this, is the moment I say yes to Christ, God imparts to me a new nature, the very nature of His Son. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians. He says, because you are sons... God sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. In other words, God gives you literally a new DNA. You're a brand new person with a whole new set of desires that you didn't have before. How many of you can say that's true in my life? And when I trusted Christ, suddenly these things began to happen inside of me that were different. I can't explain it. The only adequate explanation I can say is that, God, you're doing something in my life. He's changing you because... You are becoming the person that God has called you to be when you trusted Christ. He's given you a whole new set of desires on the inside of you. So what does that mean in my life? It means this. Listen carefully. It means that I am now free, forever free, from the penalty of sin. Romans 8 one says this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So justification, the application of this in my life, not only means that am I instantly saved that God declares me righteous, but it now it also means I'm now free from the penalty of sin. I am free from the penalty of sin. I no longer have to worry about the guilt or the penalty of sin. You see, this is a huge hang-up for a lot of believers. I struggle with it. I think you probably struggle with it too. You come to Christ and you say, you know, I'm still struggling with guilt. Every day of my life, I'm just burdened with this heavy load of guilt, and I don't know what to do with it. And God says, you don't understand, I've already done with it what needs to be done with it. How come you haven't taken my word and trusted me? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why are you carrying this guilt? Now one of two reasons you might be carrying this guilt. One, because you've never really trusted Christ in the first place. Or two, because you keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. But you see, one of the truths of when you come to Christ is that not only does He change your nature, but He changes your desires. Suddenly, I want to do God's will in my life. Before, I didn't care less about God. I could care less about who He was. But now, suddenly, I have this desire inside of me to want to do God's will with my life. And He brings into awareness sin into our lives and brings us into conviction, not to leave us in a place of guilt, but to deal with that guilt before the cross so that there is no more condemnation in our lives. You see, one of the things I've discovered, the closer you grow to God, it's like coming closer to a bright light. The closer you get to that bright light, the more you see all the inadequacies, all you see the wrinkles and the, the warts and all those ugly things that you didn't see before when you're further away from the light. As you get closer to the light that God shows you those things in your life, He doesn't show you those things to leave you there, but He shows you those things to expose them so you can say, Lord, I wasn't even where I was even thinking this. Lord, I wasn't even where I was even, I was even doing this. Would you forgive me? 
Because what is he doing? He's conforming you. He's changing you into what it means to have a relationship with him. So justification simply means this. It's that I'm free from the guilt and the penalty of sin forever. And no longer have to worry about one day as I stand before God, he's going to say, oh, you dirty sinner, you. What are you doing here? I didn't expect you to be here. When I trust Christ, I'm free from the penalty and the guilt of sin forever. That leads to the second part. Now, most of you, when you say, somebody says, are you saved? You say, yes, I'm saved. You say, well, how? Justification. I crossed that line of faith, and man, I'm right with God. I have peace with God. But you've only answered a third of the question. So, can you say you're saved? You say, yes, I'm saved. But there's another part of it, isn't there? I am being saved. And that's the word sanctification. Listen to what Romans chapter 8, verse 29 says. For those whom God foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. Now listen carefully. Justification is what is done in you. Sanctification, uh, pardon me, yeah, it's done for you. Sanctification is what is done in you. Let me say that again. Justification is what is done for you, but sanctification was done in you. Sanctification is literally conforming you to the image of Christ, to make you complete in maturity and faith and character. Now listen to one of the promises that God gives us in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. One of my favorites. It says that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. You see, one of the ways that you know you've trusted the genuine Jesus, that you've met the genuine Jesus of the Bible, is the Bible says he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Meaning simply this is that God has made a promise he will never give up on you. You may give up on yourself, and others may give up on you, but God says, listen, you are my forever child. I have unconditionally accepted you and loved you, and therefore I will never give up on you. I found this to be true so many times not only in my own life, but in the lives of others as well, where we grow disappointed with ourselves. Disappointed with life, and we go, God, I'm such a wreck, I'm such a failure, I am such a miserable person, how could you possibly love me? And God steps in, and He encourages you. He reminds you, listen, you're my child, and I will never, ever give up on you. How many of you can say that you've discovered that in your life when you've hit life's lowest place, and you think, oh, it's just not worth going on, and God says, no, it is, because I've com I'm committed to you. I'll never give up on you. He who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Sanctification simply means that, is that Christ is for me. Now he has changed me into his own likeness. So what's the application of that? The application of sanctification is this, is that I'm now free from the power of sin. Justification means that I'm free from the penalty of sin, the guilt and the penalty. But sanctification means this, I'm free from the growth and the power of sin. Do you know what that means? That means that when you came into your walk with Christ, there were things in your life, habits, temptations, bondages, strongholds, that you wrestled with again and again. You found yourself falling on your face in failure time and time again. But when you came to Christ, suddenly you had this new sense of strength, not only a new desire, but a new strength to say no to sin that you never had before. That's what sanctification means. It means now I have the power to say no to sin. I don't have to keep doing those same things over and over again and again. Listen to what Paul says. He says, for the death that he died, Jesus died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves dead to sin. I'm dead to the power of sin now because of Christ, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So we're free from the very growth, free from the very power of sin in our lives. And see, so the evidence of Christ in me is that not only do I have desires to want to do God's will, but now I have the power I didn't have before to do that will. <coughs> and you begin to change inwardly. Now, let me just share this with you as well. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 says this. That God is at work within us to do His work. 
In other words, what the Bible is saying is this, that oftentimes we look at our lives and say, boy, I need to work on this, and I need to work on that, and I need to work on this, and I need to work on that. Oh, no, I forgot about it. I need to work on that, too. And, oh, my, I forgot my wife reminded me I need to work on this over here, too. And we have this overwhelming list of things that we say, you know what, I, I don't know that I'll ever get there. And God says, just relax. You're on my growth plan. I know exactly what needs to be worked on in your life, how much, and when to move on. <coughs> you say, well, how do I know what God is working in my life? All you have to do is look around. What are those irritating things that are happening right now? Those irritating relationships, irritating circumstances. What are those things that are challenging you in your Christ-likeness? You say, I want to be like the Lord. I want to respond like the Lord in this. But man, I just find myself, if this person wasn't in my life, it would be so easy to be like Jesus. And God says, no, you don't understand. That's why that person is there. Because life is the classroom. And I've allowed these strains, these difficulties, these struggles, these irritations, they're all there. They're all there to get your attention and say, you know what, you can't do it by yourself. You need the very power of Christ in you to be transformed into the image of Christ. So all those struggles, all those difficulties, all those temptations, all those things that are going on in your life right now, God says, I know they're there. I've allowed them to be there. And I'm using those difficulties, those challenges, to cause you to depend on me, to conform you to the image of my Son. Jesus himself said that in his ministry here on earth, he said, I didn't come here to do my will, I came here to do the will of my Father. He was totally dependent upon God to work in him to do the mission that he called him to do. The same thing is true for us. We're totally dependent upon the power of God to live out the character of God that he's called us to. That's called sanctification. So the evidence of this whole new nature inside of us is that we have a whole new set of desires. Not only a new set of desires, but now the power to live out those desires. I appreciate the words of John Piper. Theologian John Piper helps us understand, get our minds around this great truth. Listen to what he says. What Jesus bought for us when he died was not the freedom from having to hold fast, but the enabling power to hold fast. Did you get that? In other words, we think I have to hold on, hold on, hold on, and God says, no, you understand. The ability to hold on in the first place comes from me. So what Jesus bought for us when he died for us was not the freedom of having to hold fast, but the enabling power to hold fast. What he bought was not the nullification of our wills as though we don't have to hold fast, but the empowering of our wills that we want to hold fast. In other words, now I want to follow Jesus. I didn't want to before, but now I want to. Why is that? Because God's enabling power inside of me wants to hold on to him. That's why that comes from him. What he bought was not the canceling of the commandment to hold fast, but the fulfillment to hold fast. What he bought was not the end of exhortation, but the triumph of exhortation. He died so that you would do exactly what Paul said in Philippians 3.12, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. It is not foolishness, he says. It is the gospel to tell a sinner to do what Christ alone can enable him to do, namely, to hope in God. So I exhort you, he says, with all my heart, reach out and take hold of that which you have been laid hold of by Christ, and hold fast with all his might. The evidence that we have part, we were part of the household of God is that we don't throw away our hope. Hebrews 10.35 says, don't throw away your confidence, which is a great reward. In other words, we don't drift into indifference and unbelief. Becoming a Christian and being one happen to be, happen in the same way, by hoping in Jesus. A kind of hoping that produces a confidence and boasting in Him. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying that when you have found and you have met and you've experienced the genuine Jesus of the Bible, He gives you an enduring hope that never goes away. He gives you an enduring desire to want to hold on to Him that never goes away. It does not mean that things will always go well. 
It does not mean that there will be an absence of troubles or trials or struggles or doubts in life. There will be. You will go through them. The point is that when you're going through them, you realize, I have a hope that I can't let go of. I cannot let go of the only hope that I have, and that is Christ alone. That is it, God at work inside of you. So sanctification simply means this, that I'm now free from the very, very growth and the power of sin. I can hold on, whereas I couldn't hold on before. Well, that's only two parts of the three parts, right? So if somebody says, are you saved? You say, what? Well, yes, I'm saved. That is justification, right? So God declares the believing sinner right with himself. But you can also say, now, I'm also I'm being saved, meaning that I'm sanctified. God is conforming me to the very image of his son. But you've only got two of the three parts. What's the third part? The third part is that I will be saved. And the word there is glorify. Glorify. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 30, listen, he says, Those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, I want you to listen carefully to what he's saying here. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. Notice that it's past tense. Mm -hmm. And what he's saying here is very important. It is staggering. He's saying that God is so convinced of your future destiny in heaven, he speaks of it as though it has already happened. God is so certain of your heavenly destination, he speaks of it as though it's past tense, it's already done. In fact, it is, spiritually speaking. Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 3 that our life, right now, the true you, that is your future, who your position in Christ, is already at the right hand of God with the Son in heaven. In other words, your heavenly destination is already secure. Because you've been justified, you've been declared God's forever child, free from the guilt and the penalty of sin. Because God is saving you now, He is sanctifying you, you are free from the growth and the power of sin. And one day, just or glorification means that you'll be free from the presence of sin. Free from the penalty of sin, free from the power of sin, and free from the presence of sin of sin. Isn't that going to be great? Amen. Amen. You know, one of these days it's going to be amazing we step into heaven. I think we're so, our world is so colored by sin right now that if we were to see a perfect heaven, we would be absolutely, absolutely mind blown. We'd go, wow! Suddenly relationships will have no, no longer have the facades around them, those sinful facades of trying to make people think that we are something or look like something that we're really not. Suddenly the insecurity, the inadequacies are all removed and we can have an honest and true relationship with each other. Any other concerns about, well, what did you mean by that? How come you said that? What do you really say? We don't have to worry about those things ever again. Suddenly we'll be able to enjoy the relationships that we've always longed for because the presence of sin will be totally absent. Won't that be wonderful? Amen. That's what it means, is that we're now free from the very presence of sin. And that's what heaven's going to be. Paul says this, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For the sin is, for sin is the sting, and the result, it results in death. One day we'll be finally and fully free from this tormented and fallen world. And Jesus tells us in John chapter 14 that he is in fact preparing a place for us. That where he is, he will come and receive us to himself again. It is a place where our souls will find that ultimate rest that we long for. It's a place that he's preparing not only of ultimate rest, but of ultimate joy, ultimate peace, ultimate fulfillment. I love the words of J.R. Packer who talks about heaven. And he describes it this way. He says, hearts may say in the course of a joyful experience, I don't want this to end. But it invariably does. The hearts of those who are in heaven say, I want this to go on forever. And it will. And it will. Heaven is a place that will be totally removed from the presence, the penalty, and the power of sin forever. Forever. And what makes this promise complete is not being in heaven. It's not being in the place of heaven. What makes heaven heaven is the person. It's Christ himself. So, now let me ask this question. 
If somebody were to ask you, are you saved? What are you going to say? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Because I am saved, yes, and I'm being saved, and I will be saved. And they'll go, what in the world are you talking about? But it's important for us to understand that as believers, that must be secured in our thinking, in our hearts. Why? Because I took the time to walk through this for you to ask this one question. Can you lose your salvation? Not according to what the Bible says, and yet there are a lot of people that come to the Bible and they say, I'm reading a warning passage in Hebrews, and it says, I think I can lose my salvation. <laughs> and that's not what he's saying. So, if that's a warning passage, and the warning is not warning me that I can lose my salvation, yet the Bible is very clear that I can't, even Jesus himself, listen, Jesus says this, the very shepherd of our souls, he says, those whom... The Father has given him, and he will never lose one of them. That is you, friend. If you've trusted Christ, if you know you have that personal relationship with him, God says, I will never lose you. Jesus says, I will never lose you. Listen to what he says. This is the will of him who sent me, Jesus says, that all that he has given me, I lose nothing. Jesus has a perfect record. He's never lost one. If you've placed your faith in Christ, you've been justified. You're being sanctified, and you will be glorified. You belong to Him, and your eternal destiny is so certain, God speaks of it as past tense. You are glorified. Done. Yeah. And so what He's saying behind this is this, is that we don't have to worry about losing our salvation. So then what is the point of a warning passage if it's not warning me that I can lose my salvation? Well, I want to talk to you briefly about something that the author is going to unpack throughout the remainder of the book that we don't hear enough about. This passage, or these five warning passages, are not talking about the loss of salvation. Listen carefully. They're not talking about the loss of salvation. They're talking about the loss of reward. Not the loss of salvation, but the loss of reward. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. This is a passage we don't hear enough about or truth that we don't hear enough teaching about. The reality is this, one day, every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, Romans chapter 14, verse 12, the Apostle Paul tells us that we will stand before Christ one day and will give an accounting for our lives. And that accounting, that judgment seat of Christ, does not have to do with where our eternity is going to be spent, but rather it has to do with the rewards of how well we lived out Christ's will for our lives this side of eternity. We don't hear enough about that. But listen to Paul. He capsulizes it in this passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, For no one can lay uh, a foundation other than the one that is already laid, that is Jesus Christ. He alone is our, our salvation. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, straw. But on the judgment day, what judgment day? The day that every believer stands before God and gives an account for how they lived out Christ's will for their life. He says that on judgment day, he says, fire will reveal what, what the work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, the builder will receive a reward. Now listen to what he says. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like somebody barely escaping through a wall of flames. It is not a day that we want to say, you know, <laughs> I've trusted Jesus. And man, if I can make it into heaven by the skin of my teeth, whoosh, I don't care. I've made it. It's okay. And God says, no, 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 you don't understand. Yes, you should rejoice that you're saved. But don't think that now that you've come to know Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, that you can live any old way you want, that you can do what you want to do. There will be an accounting, there will be a reckoning of your life, not your eternal destiny, but your eternal rewards. Jesus talked a lot about rewards. He talked a lot about rewards in the life to come after we've trusted Him. And the Bible talks a lot about rewards Time and time again, I want to share with you just, let me just share with you about a dozen kinds of ways that God is going to look at your life and He's going to say, okay, as I stand before that what's called the famous seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, 
That is the judgment seat of Christ. Oftentimes people see this kind of like the, the Olympic, um, the Olympic uh, places of reward, where you have the bronze, you have the silver, and you have the gold. It's a place of a time of great celebration. But it will also be a time, I think, of disappointment. Because you may be thinking, you know, I'm really working hard on that bronze medal. I'm working really hard on that silver. I know I'm going to get the gold in this. You may be working hard on that. And you might be disappointed. Not that you don't already know that now. Jesus tells us in John chapter 5, he who does his own will is going to know that. He who does the Father's will is going to know that. You know. Because the Spirit of God is at work in you. Guiding you, directing you. But let me share with you some of the ways that we'll be accountable in our lives. How we treat other believers will be held accountable. How we exercise authority over others. How we use our God-given abilities. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10, God says, He's given every one of us at least one ability, one spiritual gift, sometimes more. How are you employing those? One day we'll be held accountable and God says, say, listen, I gave you the gift of evangelism. And what did you do with it? You sat on your hands all your life. I gave you the gift of exhortation. I gave you the gift of leadership. I gave you the gift of whatever it may be. And what did you do with it? We'll be held accountable for the gifts and abilities he's given us. How we use our money. How we spend our time. How we suffer for Christ. Now, the Bible doesn't talk about suffering for Christ, meaning that, uh, oh, gee, I have to put up with this person. But rather, suffering for Christ, meaning walking in his will. And for his namesake, being cursed. For his namesake, being persecuted. Suffering for Christ. How we run the race that God has called us. You see, you've been called to a unique race that is yours alone. Nobody else can run it. It's yours alone. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, run the race so as to win it. Because only one person wins the race. You've been called to run a race that is unique to you. How are you running that race? One day God will tell you. How effectively we control our old nature. Because sanctification says have been freed from the very growth and the very power of sin. So how are you doing with that old nature? Well, I still have a little bit of a temper. <laughs> yeah, a little cranky sometimes. But that's just the way I am. You have to accept that. Uh, so I tell a fib every once in a while. You know, I kind of add some color and variety to that, you know, just kind of spice it up a little bit. So how are you doing with that old nature? God says, I've given you the very power to break it. Are you saying no to it? How many souls we have witnessed to and when for Christ. How we, react, how we react to temptation. How much we look forward to Christ's second appearing. By the way, do you know the Bible teaches that he may appear at any moment for his church? Did you know that? Yes. And the Bible says that we will be rewarded based on our desire, our excitement of looking forward to his second appearing. And then how faithful, we've been, how faithful we've been to God's word and to his people. Those are just a dozen ways in which the Bible talks about those. We stand before him one day and say, how did you do? And what we long for, every one of us, is this. To hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Don't you long to hear those words? Amen. Well done, good and faithful servant. I know. I know that we struggle in this world. I know that we struggle in our relationships. I know that we struggle with ourselves. I know that we struggle in our relationship with God. And the book of Hebrews is to remind us, examine the Jesus that you believe in. Make sure you know the genuine Jesus. Because it's going to be very, very important when it comes to trials, when it comes to struggles, when it comes to uh, the doubts in your life. You need to know the real Jesus. So in Hebrews chapter 3, I'm not going to take the time to explore too much this morning. But let me just introduce it by saying this. In Hebrews chapter 3, verses uh, 7 through 19, the author is going to introduce us to Psalm 95. 
It's a psalm that every Jew is well aware of. They know the words by memory because they hear it so often. But in this psalm is a jarring reminder, a jarring reminder that their ancestors, whom God delivered miraculously by miracles the world had never seen before, done great things, had delivered them from Egypt, had brought them into the desert, fed them for 40 years, and done all kinds of things. Their very ancestors, whom God blessed with amazing blessings, delivered them from bondage. Their very ancestors left a spiritual heritage of regret. A spiritual heritage of regret. And the author is saying this. Make sure that when you come to know who this Jesus is, that you don't come to the end of your days with regret like they did. Could you imagine what it must have been like for the, the, the forefathers who were out in the desert as they died one by one entering into a sandy grave because of their own mule-headed, stubborn unbelief? As they stood before God, now the question is, were they saved? That's a good question. Yes, they were. Why? Because they were saved by the blood of the Lamb. That's what the Exodus is all about. The problem was they never grew out of their toddler years. They were stuck in the terrible twos. And they never really grew up. And that's what the author is saying. Listen, the reason they ended their lives in that early sandy grave and never got to experience the promised land, all the great joys that they looked forward to with their family, is because they lived with a life or a heart of unbelief, of stubbornness. They held back. And he says, I don't want the same thing for you. One day, people are going to look back on your life. Yesterday, I had a memorial service for a man that I've known for about 20 years. As I looked back into his life and tried to understand his own personal relationship with the Lord, I recognized here was a man who had trusted Christ, and he left a legacy of faith in Christ for his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren. Question is for you. God has not promised you tomorrow. What legacy of faith are you leaving behind? What will be the epitaph on your grave? What kind of spiritual journey will people look back at your lives and say, Wow, he or she really lived for Christ? What's that going to look like? The author of Hebrews is going to challenge us to look back at the past and say, here are people who had it all. They had miracle after miracle after miracle, blessing after blessing after blessing. Huh, that's kind of funny. That sounds kind of like us. <clears throat> we live in the most incredibly lavish country in the world. By standards, the rest of the world could only dream of. We have it all. And yet, we are the most complainingest unhappy, miserable people around. But that should not be true of believers. Our task should be one of leaving a spiritual heritage of thankfulness and confidence in Christ. We pray. I want to begin as we end this time this morning, just asking you this. Are you saved? I'm not asking you, are you saved, that you're being saved, or that one day you will be saved, but I'm asking you, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord right now? Have you entered into a relationship with Him? Have you come to that place of brokenness, that place of recognition in your own heart, where you realize you need a rest, a fulfillment, meaning in life that nothing in the world can offer, and that Jesus Christ alone is the answer. 
Have you come to that place? Have you crossed that line of faith? Maybe you're here today and you say you know about Jesus. Maybe you've been to church, maybe you've been baptized, maybe in your own mind, but you know in your own heart you've never really trusted Christ. Would you cross that line today of faith? Would you say yes to him? Would you say, Lord Jesus, would you please forgive me for my sins? Forgive me, Lord, for I have sinned against you, for I have rejected you. Forgive me for not taking your word serious. And I'm asking, Lord, would you come into my life? Would you grant me by your grace your forgiveness? I believe, Lord Jesus, you died on the cross for my sins, is my sin substitute. And I know I, I need you as my Savior and Lord. Help me know, to know what it means to walk in a genuine relationship with you. To experience and know the real Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, as we continue on in this great book of Hebrews, as we continue to be challenged in our walk with you, Father, we pray that you would bring awareness in our lives, that we would live with an eternal perspective. Don't let us get caught up in the here and now, so much so that we lose sight that we were made for eternity. And that everything we're doing here and now has ramifications in eternity to come. Enable us, embolden us, empower us, I pray, Father, to live for you with all our might and our hearts and our minds to be faithful to your will in this life. That one day we'll hear you say to each one of us, well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name we pray.